a pull hitter like Frank Thomas, the polo grounds proved a tailor-made part. Thomas paced the match in the power department. Welcome to this edition of One on One. I'm Howie Rose, and today it's a real treat to go back to the very beginning in the history of the New York Mets. Frank Thomas hit 34 home runs playing for the original Mets, who of course play their home games at the Polo Grounds. As we tape this, he's a couple of days shy of his 90th birthday, and it is an absolute thrill to have you here. Frank, welcome. It's good to be here, Howie. When was the last time that you did anything or made any kind of an appearance on behalf of the Mets? Because I know it's been a while. Yeah, it has been. But it's nice that they still remember me. Well, you know, look, you set a record that held for quite a while. 17 19- years. Yep. Dave Kingman came along and, and would break the home run record that you set in 1962. And I but- happened to be there when he broke it in Pittsburgh. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I was at the game. Did you have any conversation with him afterwards or post no, with the photographers no. or anything? You just happened not, to be there. Not at all. Just... I left the ballpark (laughs) (laughs) knowing that my record was gone. (laughs) You know, before we even talk about your baseball career, I want to go back to the beginning when you were thinking about and actively pursued a life in the seminary. That's true. Now, there's a big difference between big league baseball and the seminary. Yes, sir. What swayed your opinion towards baseball? Well, sports was so predominant in my career, okay, and I just... uh, I just couldn't do it, and uh, I lied to the priest when I was up. I wrote a letter to my mother, okay, telling her that I was thinking about leaving, okay, and you weren't allowed to do this, okay, but one of the kids was going back to Pittsburgh for an operation, so I gave him the letter. I said, call my mother and tell her to come to the hospital, and, and you can give her the letter, all right? So my mother came, got the letter, read it, went home crying like anything, and my dad says to her, what are you crying about? Well, she wouldn't say anything. So he probably put two and two together because she had just gone to the hospital to visit a kid. So he sat down and wrote a letter to the priest. And in the meantime, I'm doubting my vocation. And the priest says, do you want to go home? I says, yeah. He says, well, why don't you go down to chapel and pray a little more so you know that you're doing the right thing, which I did. And I'm, as I'm cleaning the stairs, which was part of my job there, and he come up and says, you sure you want to go? And I says, yes. Then he handed me the letter from my dad. And after I read the letter from my dad, I went back into his office and I says, Father, I says, I lied to you. I says, what I really want to do when I go home is I want to become a major league ball player. I said, because I love baseball so much. And that was the story. Of course, if you're leaning towards a life in the seminary, At the very least, the language in a big league dugout or a clubhouse is a little saltier than what you might have heard in the cemetery. Did you have to reconcile that? Well, what it is, my first year at Tallahassee, Florida, you know, and I had all this language. I grabbed a kid. I said, I don't like that. And then I stepped back. I said, you know, I can't be that way. I can go by my example and let them see that I don't like it. And from that time on, every dugout I went into, they wouldn't swear. Well, I suppose on one level you could say that if anyone was going to be moved towards saying some things he might not want to say in his heart, being with a team that lost 120 games in 1962 might have tested that resolve. But in its own way, the 62 Mets are legendary because of who they were, the players that they had been during the prime of their careers. If if you guys had come together five years earlier, how much different a team would it have been? Well, even even that year, Howie, if you if you look at back at the record book, we lost 51, 51 games by one run in the seventh, eighth, and ninth innings. So if we win fifty games, fifty one games, that gives us seventy some games, right? We're right there and fighting for the planet. What did you think when you got to spring training? You'd had an accomplished career. You'd been with the Pirates. You'd had home runs there, set a rookie record for home runs by right, still records, Pirates still third stands. baseman. Yeah, still stands today. Uh, you'd been with the Braves, a really good team that had come off winning a, a pennant in a World Series. What was going through your head when you showed up in St. Petersburg in 1962? Just time to play baseball. And it doesn't make any difference who I played with or for. I just love baseball that much. Uh, I always told my wife at the time, before I got married, I says, you know, baseball's my first love. 
you know, you're number two. <laughs> and I said, go. and after I left baseball, and I said, I says, well, now that I'm finished baseball, I says, you moved up to number one. But if you give me any more static, I'm going to move you back down to number two. <laughs> she didn't like it very well. But that, that's how I felt, I mean, because I love the game so much. Were you particularly close with any of the teammates that you sort of inherited in 1962 from previous relationships or teams? Well, well you know, Jim Hickman, okay. I mean, you know, he's my roommate, and um, he was the type of player that uh, Casey thought could have been a, a great ball player. And Casey was the type of manager, he did different things with the writers than he did with the players. If he wanted a player to know something, he wouldn't go right to the player. He'd stand close to his locker and saying things to the writers to let that person know this. And I would tell K Jim, I said, Jim, He's trying to pep you up a little bit because he thinks he, you're a great ball player. But it took, it went the wrong way with Jim, okay? And it hurt him. And when he was traded to Chicago, look what he did. Yeah, he had some terrific years for the right, Cubs. Right. And he ends up with the Cubs in 1969 when the Mets overtake them and win it all. But I guess we got through about three, maybe four minutes without really delving into Casey Stengel at all, which might <laughs> be a record for talking to a 1962 Met. But as long as you brought him up, Tell us about your relationship well, I, with you know, Casey. Well, uh, uh, another player, I, I, I correspond with Cranepool. Okay. And I correspond with Ron Hunt, I call, I call them. You know, Ron and I were, were pretty good buddies and stuff like that. So. But Casey, you know, I can't tell you very much about Casey because I was always out in the field, okay? But one day we're in, we're in the dugout and we had a man on first and second and Hamas was coaching at third base. And I says, Case, he must have looking for a sign. And Casey says, no, we're not going to bow. We're going to surprise him. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't say anything more after that. And then when I went through that streak in August 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, where I hit six home runs in three consecutive games, okay, and just missed one in the first game of the doubleheader on Sunday against the Reds and hit one in the 14th inning to win the ball game, where I could have had eight home runs in five games, okay, which I don't think, would have ever been broken in that light, okay? But when that streak went in the first, second, and third against Philadelphia, we started, and doctor gave me the glasses that were yellow, made the, the night look like daylight, okay? I hit the first home run, and then when I hit the second home run, wearing those glasses, I'm running at third base and coming in the dugout, and Casey came over and says, Where'd you get those glasses? I said, the trainer gave them to me. He said, well, tell them to order a grocery for everybody else. <laughs> yeah, that figures. And then another, another story is, you know, I was a pool hitter, okay? Polo grounds was a great park for me. And in 62, they had a, sh a, a ship on foul lines, okay? And whoever hit the ship the most, either on a ground ball or on a bounce or on a fly, you would get so many points. Okay, eventually Ashford won it, okay? And I'm hitting the one day, and the ball goes foul. He said, if you want to own a boat, he said, why don't you join the Navy? Because <laughs> <laughs> I kept pulling the ball foul, you know, as if they said, he's trying to hit that. Well, you're a natural and, pull hitter anyway. Right, right. So, but, victim uh, of circumstance. I mean, he forgot more baseball than I'll ever know. And when I had my kids come up for an old, for an old timers game, Okay, and they sat in the front and we were, we were rained out that time because it just stormed and we sat on the bus on, on the bridge for I don't know how long and he was just telling all kinds of stories to the kids and, and they really enjoyed him. I'm going to ask a question that I've really not had the opportunity to ask many before, but over the last 10 or 12 years there have been a couple of teams that have come along and come close to losing 120 games which is what the Mets lost in 1962. I've always felt, as crazy as this might sound, that that's a part of Mets lore which would be great if it never changed, especially because it was the basement for, or the foundation really, for what became a world championship only eight years later. They went from 120 losses to 100 wins and a world championship. Would you like to see some team lose 120 or 121, or is there anything about that 120 that somehow you guys embrace? No, not really. I mean, I, you know, ballplayers have so much pride about themselves. You go out there every day, you forget about what you did yesterday. 
but you can't bring them back, okay? You play each day as it comes, and you do, do your best. I mean, we lost all those games. Any which way you want to think about losing a ball game, we lost it, okay? So it probably helped us in the long run, knowing that these things can happen, which maybe some of us really didn't know was going to happen. And, but I enjoyed my stay in, stay in New York. I mean, I had a great year for them, okay? And, and the fans were always great to me. But I've been very fortunate, and I thank the good Lord for it because any ballpark that I have ever gone into, opposing teams, Philadelphia loved me when I played for Pittsburgh, and when I got to Philadelphia, they loved me more. When I got to Milwaukee, and they took hold of me in Milwaukee because it's a, a Polish and ethnic group out there, and I was very fortunate. The good Lord's been good to me. Well, for all the talk about Casey Stengel, I think what a lot of people might not realize is that that Mets coaching staff in 1962 was loaded with really terrific baseball people, including Rogers Hornsby. I mean, this guy hit 424 one year. Right. Rogers Hornsby was, in effect, the hitting coach for the Mets that first year. What kind of relationship did you have with him? I used to sit in every game that we would go on the road. I would sit with him in the lobby, and talk baseball, and talk hitting with him. Okay, I picked a lot of brains, including his, Ted Williams, Joe DiMaggio, okay, just to name a few. Got their different theories of hitting, okay? But you know, you as a player yourself have to have your own way of hitting. And you can put some of those things that you learn from the great hitters into practice. It might not help you, but then it might help you. And that's what I did, and I just watched the way they hit. I can remember talking to Ted Williams in, in a spring training game, and he says, what's the pitcher's best pitch that's pitching today? And I told him. And he waited for that pitch to hit the ball out of the ballpark. That's another good reason why you, know, you pick things out. So I studied the pitchers. When I sat on the bench, I watched the pitchers pitch to everybody. I can remember Kiner saying to me, he says, Frank, you watch the way they pitch me because that's the way they're going to pitch you because you're, you're a power hitter. A similar type hitter, and, yeah. That's right. Now, yeah. you crossed paths with Ralph at the very beginning of your career. He was still in Pittsburgh, and you had just come up with the Pirates. Hi. What was it like playing with Ralph? My first year with Ralph, okay, God rest his soul. We're playing the Cubs, ball hitting left center. He says, go get it, kid. <laughs> <laughs> We'll assume Ralph's back was acting up at that point in his career because it really did shorten it. I'll never forget that. But uh, we, we became great friends. And, uh, you know, we both had the trouble with Ricky yeah. and stuff like that. Ralph so. used to say, and this is one of Ralph Kiner's famous lines, he used to say that Branch Ricky had all the money and all the players and he never let them get together. That's true. Was your experience with Ricky the same? Yep, same way. And I had, no, you know, I had nothing to do with mine because Chili Doy was a writer for the Sun-Telegraph all right, and he would, he'd go to church on Sunday. My dad would be there, and he'd, he'd talk to my dad. He says, how's Frank doing? And I was in the minor leagues, and, and my dad would tell him he's doing very well. So Chile would put an article in the paper, all right? So now when all this came about, when it came time for contract time, after the 53 season, which I had a great year, which is still a record for first year with 30 home runs, that's a long time to hold a record, okay? and. It, Chili would put it in paper, put these in the paper, all right? So now, when I went and talked Ricky, he says, well, I'm going I'm to give you a nice raise. I asked for $15,000. He says, I'm going to give you twelve five. He said, you have another good year. He says, I'll take real good care of you. I said, well, that's good. It's like going to confession. I said, you come out there and you feel pretty good. And I signed the contract. And now, in 54, I had another good year. So now, I figure, well, gee, I'm going to get nice little salary. Well, what do you think he offered me? The difference on what I'd asked for the year before. He wanted to give me 15000 I had asked for 25000 So now I'm sitting there. And holding, the old man's in, in Bradenton. The Twig's in Pittsburgh. I'm in Pittsburgh. Meaning his son. <laughs> I'm watching the ball game on TV, and a big thing comes right across the state, right across the street. If Thomas doesn't get $25,000, he's not going to sign. I called Twig the next day. I said, your dad's a liar. He always said he never divulges anybody's salary negotiation. 
and here, he come right out. He said, oh, it's probably a mistake. I said, no. I said, you're here, I'm here, and he's there. Who's he? We're the only three that knew what I'd asked for. Okay, so now he comes home. I'm not getting anywhere with Twig. I says, when, you're, when your dad comes home, I says, why don't you set up an appointment so I can come out and talk to him? He said, I don't think dad wants to talk to you. I said, well, I think you ought to give me that courtesy. So he come home. I'm walking behind him into his office. He sat down. He threw, well, just went like that, threw everything off the desk, all his papers and everything. He said, do you negotiate with the newspapers? He says, that's how we'll do our negotiation. I'll read the newspapers, and then I'll see what else you're going to put in a newspaper, and that's how we'll do our negotiations. So I said to my sister, I said, Mr. Ricky, I said, I shouldn't even call you Mr. Ricky. I said, the way you're treating me like I'm dirt under your feet. I said, but I'm calling you that. I said, but, you know, I had nothing to do with what was in the paper. I said, my dad's interested in me the same as you're interested in your son. They walked out. And you ended up signing for what? 18. Not what you wanted, of course. And but then, that's not the end of it. Okay, now, I go to spring training. You know, I've been working out. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not that stupid that I, that I wasn't going to be, because I was going to say, they put me in the lineup right away. Ryan Dorn's pitching. Okay? First time up, I a home run. Next time up, I'm bunting for a base hit. Then he took me out of the lineup. Okay? Now, I, I, get the, I get a cold developed where I'm throwing up. Okay, I lost 17 pounds in three and a half weeks. We're in Pittsburgh. I threw up in front of, in front of Fred Haney. He said, you've been sick. I said, well, the trainer knew I was sick. He said, well, I didn't know. I said, well, I've been sick for three and a half weeks. I lost 17 and a half pounds. And he said, I didn't know. Okay, so now they kept playing me. Okay, and it was Ricky's doing because he, he wanted to make an example. All right, we're in, we're in Cincinnati, and he comes to Cincinnati, and he calls me on the phone. He says, I want to see you in my office, up in my room. So I go up to his room, and the first thing he said, he says, the writers and everybody saying it's because of me that you're having the type of year that you're having. I said, Mr. Ricky, I know what you're trying to do. I see you're trying to make an example. I says, what was wrong? I says, I love baseball. I says, I don't like the way you're treating me. And I said, but I'm not going to give up baseball. I'm going to go out there. If I'm in the lineup, I'm going to give 100%, regardless of anything else. Uh, and then I was probably the first to know that he was going to retire. As he said to me, he says, I'm going to retire, and I'm going to tell whoever takes my job not to cut your salary. I said, Mr. Ricky, I don't want any favors from you, whatever. You do what you want to do. I'm going to do what I want to do and what I should do and what has to be done. But I don't want any favors from you. And that's the way it was. Now, Joe Brown takes over. And contract 10 comes around. And he says to me, Mr. Ricky said not to cut your salary. I said, Joe, you do what you want to do. He said, I'm going to give you a $1,000 raise. I says, fine. I says, but. If you throw that back in my face, if I have another good year for you, and you throw that back in my face when we're negotiating salary, I'm going to give you the $1,000 back, and we're going to negotiate for two years. So what was it like by the time you got to the Mets? You had that great 1962. I would imagine you had to negotiate a contract with George Weiss for 1963. How would that have gone? Different than Ricky, maybe? Well, John McHale from Milwaukee. First of all, you know, I don't know whether you know the record that we set when I was with the Milwaukee Ball Club. We used it from the time baseball was invented in the 1800s until June 8, 1961, which is the anniversary today. We as a team hit four home runs in succession in one inning by four different players. Matthews hit the first one in Cincinnati in the seventh inning off Jim Maloney. Hank Aaron hit the second one off Maloney. They brought in Marshall Pritchard and Mitchie Joe Ackow hit the third one. I made baseball history by hitting the fourth one. From all the great hitters who have played this game, I'm the first major league player who's ever done that, and I don't think it's ever going to be broken. All right? So now Mikhail says to me after that, he said, we want to sign you. I looked up at him. I says, this is June. I says, I may go bad, and I'll be so you'll be sorry. I may go good, and I'll be sorry. I said, but I'll sign before I go home. 
called me up in September. He said, we want to sign you before you go home. Uh, I said, before we do any negotiations, I want to ask you one question. What are your intentions for me come 1962? He says, you're going to be our left fielder. I said, if that's the case, and I can't be any more fair than this, you bring out whatever contract you want me to sign, and I'll sign it. I'm not asking for any figures. You bring out whatever you want, I'll sign it. November, I get a call. I'm up hunting. My wife called. She says, he just got sold to the Mets. Now, what he did is he, sold, he, he signed me knowing that he was going to sell me to an expansion team. Lied to me. Well, what about Weiss? How was he to deal with then? Well, Weiss, I had a good year for, for, for yeah. Weiss, okay? I called Casey. I said, Casey, George, they want to give me a raise. He said, don't you sign until you hear from me. I said, okay, fine. He calls me a couple weeks later. He says, you can sign when George calls you. He got me a $5,000 raise. All right. Well, that works. But, you know, I said to George, I said, you know, I know what the situation was, George, and so do you. You know, it wasn't my fault. I mean, I signed in good grace, okay? Why should I be penalized when I was fair, okay? He said, I'm sorry. He said, you already signed. That was the extent of his conversation. Well, there still were some fun moments, I'm sure, with that 62 team. And, you know, you hear the story all the time about Yolo Tango, with Ilio Chacon, the shortstop, and Richie Ashburn getting that together. That was fabricated. Was it? Yes, absolutely. You took the question right out of my... Fabricated to no end. So this never that's happened? Richie, no, it never happened. Because I, I wasn't that fast to, to catch up to Richie, <laughs> number one. So, no, never happened. That was supposedly when uh, Ashburn and Chacon decided they were going to use Yolo Tango as a sign right. verbally so that there wouldn't be any collisions. Right. And then apparently you were involved in one, and right. you never spoke Spanish. Nope, <laughs> never did. Well, I didn't. Even, I didn't even know that you had that. That you know, talking that way. Well, give me, give me the two or three biggest characters that you enjoyed being with on those early day Mets. I know you say you still are in touch with Crane Pool and Hunt and some of them, but probably Throne Thronebury. Yeah. Okay. What was he like? Thronebury was, you know, pretty good hitter. He he stood like Mano until he swung the bat. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember when he hit, hit the ball, he rounded first, rounded second, ends up on third. And they said he's out. Casey comes running out, was out to first base, and he goes out to second base, and Dusty Boggus says, Case, he missed second too. <laughs> so that one really happened. That, well, that, yeah, that happened. That's legendary. How did he handle, we're talking about Marv Thronberry, who was made as something of a symbol for the ineptitude of, of the early day Mets, but how did he handle that stereotype? Uh, I guess he liked it because I know uh, Jay Hook put a, thing on his, <laughs> put a thing on his locker. I forget what he put on his. Marvelous Marv, I think <laughs> yeah. he said, right? Marvelous Marv. Yeah. And he did okay with it anyway, because he wound up making money doing a light beer commercial. Yeah, he did. He did. For just that reason. But right. before we let you go, one or two other things real quickly about those early day Mets. You played those first two years in the polo grounds. And before you were traded in the summer of 1964, you did move with the Mets from the polo grounds to Shea Stadium. What were your impressions of Shea when you came out of the polo grounds and that nice, cozy left field line and came to a more symmetrical ballpark? Well, it, it was a challenge. But... What happened that year is we're in San Francisco, and Bob Bolin count 3-0 and on me and threw behind me and hit me in my elbow. They rushed me to the hospital, jabbed me with the needle, took blood out of me. I come back home to New York, play a doubleheader, okay, on a Sunday afternoon, Monday, had no idea what the problem was. Went to the doctors. He says, you got epididymitis, a staph infection. I was out for 41 days. Got out of the hospital, haven't had a bat in my hand for 41 days. We're playing St. Louis. Last half of the ninth inning, Kurt Simmons is pitching. Casey says, Thomas, get a bat. I says, Case. He <laughs> says, can you hit? I said, well, I haven't had a bat for 41 days. I said, I'll do the best I can. 
Got to count three to two, hit the ball out of the ballpark, won the ball game, three to two. I guess when you're strong and you're a good athlete, good things happen. Well, and this is what happened. Well, it's been a real good thing to happen to us to be able to reconnect with Frank Thomas after all these years. Uh, what's retirement like? What are you doing with yourself these days? I've been retired for 34 years, okay? I get anywhere from eight to 10 letters a week. I answer every letter handwriting. I have two charities that I donate money to. And this char these charities came about in Charleston, South Carolina, when I was invited to a Jim Kelly, the Buffalo quarterback for a golf tournament. And while we were there, they asked us to go to the hospital to visit a couple of kids dying of cancer. And Dempsey, the center and I both went, looked into the first room. The lady in charge says, to the kid that was 17 years old, dying of cancer, he said, you just got back from Disney. What did you like best about Disney? He said, the girls. <laughs> so then he said, well, you go down the hall, a little four-year-old girl down there, and go down and talk to her. So I poked my head in, she was cutting out those little dolls like the little girls mm -hmm. used to do. And I says, you're doing this, so when your mother comes, you'll be able to show her exactly what you're doing. She looked up at me, she says, Mr. Thomas, my mother can't come. She has to stay home with the other kids. Brought tears to my eyes. And from that time on, I turned back to the lady and I said, from now on, I'm going to be charging for my autograph and you're going to get the money. And I've been doing this now for about 35 years. I sell the pictures that I have, okay? I sell the pictures with the four home runs, okay? And my charities make out very well because, to give you an example, I went to the Garden Home Show in Pittsburgh and Ramona, my girlfriend, went with me and uh, I walked in, a friend there was yelling for all the people to go over and sign up for free magazines. And he's a great fan of mine. And, and he said, I says, how come, I opened the flyer. I says, Penguins are coming to sign autographs. Uh, Steelers are coming to sign autographs. I said, no Pirates, what's wrong? He said, I don't know. He said, you want to talk to the man? I says, yeah. So the man come down. I said, how come no pirates? He said, well, they used to send pirates over. He said, but they don't do it anymore, and I have no reason why. I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make a deal with you. You let me come the next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, because it's held for 10 days, but I had things that I have to do prior to that. So I said, I'll go Friday, Saturday, Sunday, if you let me sell my pictures. He said, we'd love to have you. In three days, I sold pictures, and I made $2,000, $1,000 for each one of my charities. Where can someone get in touch with you if they want to help contribute to those charities? Well, they can call me. They can call my home in Pittsburgh, area code 1-412-848-4302. Try finding a big league player today who will just like that give out his home phone number, but this is for such a great reason. And we are so appreciative, and I personally have so enjoyed reconnecting with an original Met, Frank Thomas. Thanks for joining us, Frank. It's been great. Thank you, Howie. I've enjoyed it. We'll see you next time.